My name is Ward Shanahan. I'm the president of the Montana Historical Society Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization formed to assist the Montana Historical Society with its important projects. The most important project right now is the preservation of Virginia City and Nevada City, which are birthplaces of Montana government and Montana business economy. We have formed an, a partnership between the National Trust for Historic Preservation, the Montana Historical Society Foundation, and the Virginia City Preservation Alliance to get this job done. We're in the process of raising money to buy these properties that belong to the Bovey family, which has pr preserved the, the property for more than 50 years. But those properties are in danger of being lost, and we hope you'll help us preserve them. You'll be hearing from us about this in the future, and we hope we can count on your assistance. Thank you very much. The following program has been brought to you in part by Virginia City Preservation Alliance. The Alliance has been established for the restoration and preservation of historic Virginia City. Your tax-deductible donations will help in this effort. Myrie Jewelry. Luray Myrie, master goldsmith, uses native gold and stones in her creations. Myrie Jewelry, located in the old Elling Bank building in Virginia City, has been a tradition in fine jewelry since 1931. Cousins Candy Shop a unique and fun-filled candy store featuring an old-fashioned taffy pulling machine and delicious homemade fudge. With over 300 varieties of delicious candies to choose from, it's an experience the whole family will enjoy. The Stonehouse Inn. Tucked away on a peaceful side street, this century-old home, listed on the National Register of Historic Places, welcomes you. Guests enjoy the ambience of the 1800s and Montana's hospitality. Virginia City, Montana. Once Montana's territorial capital, Virginia City is America's finest example of an 1860s gold miners camp. Take a step back in time on the boardwalks of Montana's past. Virginia City, Montana, 1863. Side one of the largest gold rushes in America. Back east, the North was locked in mortal combat with the South. The fate of a nation was hanging in the balance. Out west, another battle was being fought. The rule of law was being challenged by the fist and the gun. Virginia City, Montana was the site of one of the most important showdowns in American Western history, when grassroots justice had to stand up against violence and lawlessness. Virginia City is the last surviving gold rush town of its type left in the United States. It was on the map even before there was a map. The discovery of gold along Alder Gulch lit the fuse for an explosion of growth, politics, vigilantism, and cultural diversity that was unequaled in the West. But Virginia City is more than a place where lawlessness and greed ran rampant. It represents the establishment of law and order over the chaos of the early West. In 1803, Napoleon sold France's claim to land in the United States for $15 million to help finance his war machine. A year later, Tom Jefferson sent Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to map much of the northwestern United States. Intent on finding a mighty river that crossed east to west to the Pacific, Lewis and Clark were among the first whites ever to see the far reaches of the Louisiana Purchase. In the spring of 1805, Clark described in his journal a stream he named Willard's Creek. The creek was much like hundreds of others he'd charted, and the notation became a historical postscript of little interest to anyone except occasional trappers that visited the area over the next 50 years. Then on July 28, 1862, a wandering party of gold miners from Colorado camped on Willard's Creek and panned the gravel in the stream bed. So began the biggest gold rush since 1849. Word spread like lightning, drawing people from Nevada, Colorado, and California. The news attracted not only seasoned miners, but doctors, lawyers, merchants, farmers, ranchers, soldiers, and people fleeing the war between the states. The flood of people coming to Montana forced the Secretary of War to post soldiers to maintain a semblance of order. 
the big thing that's going on in the United States at that time is the Civil War. And in those early years, uh, a great deal of the, of the ferocity in the Civil War was in the West. And so the, bad, the, the struggles in Missouri and in Arkansas uh, had a direct bearing also on what went on in the West, especially after the Battle of Pea Ridge, Arkansas. Uh, the, the, sh the broken Confederate armies did contribute some refugees to the Colorado and Montana and Idaho gold fields. A lot of historical controversy has surrounded that. Uh, there have been some, I think, misinformed who argue there were relatively few, for example, Confederate sympathizers in places like Idaho and Colorado and Montana. And they make that mistaken argument by not taking into account that a great many Confederate sympathizers or even fighters were not necessarily from Confederate states, but from places like Missouri that were divided, or Kentucky, uh, between pro and anti-Union forces. And as the Union forces, uh, by the midpoint of the Civil War, began to prevail, uh, there was a pretty heavy uh, element of these people coming west. The bottom line is that in places like Idaho and Montana, the political and social climate was very much torn by pro and anti-Union forces. That's hardly surprising. These were Americans, and there's a Civil War going on. So you get a combination of gold rushes and Civil War politics that made this a very, very combustible place at that time. Overnight, a crude mining camp sprang up, and within a year, Bannock swelled to more than 5,000 people, most of whom were lured there by the hope of making a quick fortune. There's a fair amount of truth to the fact that there's a Yankee element and a Southern element. The Yankee element is pro-order, and the pro-Southern element is anti-order. And Beyond all that, of course, is there's just a good old dose of frontier lawlessness, that, that even the people that are the friends of the Union and of law and order are not coming here, most of them, to build communities. They're coming here to make some money and get back out again. And so it, it makes it very difficult to establish uh, civilized communities in that kind of a climate. Uh, there's, if people, this isn't like a farmer's frontier where people are coming to stay. Most of them aren't coming to stay. The first sheriff of Bannock was Henry Plummer. In 1863, Plummer freighted a turkey from Salt Lake City to Bannock for $40 so he could serve a proper Thanksgiving dinner to a newcomer, Colonel Wilbur Fisk Sanders. Little did Plummer know that within the year, Sanders would preside over Plummer's hanging. During the spring of 1863, some men left Bannock to prospect for gold along the Yellowstone River. After a hair-raising encounter with the Crow Indians, the men promised to return to Bannock. On their way back, they stopped at camp along a stream in a gulch lined with alders. As was their custom, the men started to pan for gold. One of the party, William Fairweather, would find what would turn out to be the largest placer gold strike in North America. The men quickly made plans to resupply and return to Alder Gulch. They swore secrecy, but such a secret was impossible to keep. Within days, 200 miners were swarming over the gulch, staking claims. By the end of summer, 10,000 people crowded 17 miles of Alder Gulch. The mining camps turned into towns with names like Virginia City and Nevada City. The gold strike attracted people from all walks of life, among them hardened criminals who took the claims of others by fraud or force, killing if they had to. Virginia City became a magnet for every adventurer, gambler, card sharp, and deserter from the Union and Rebel armies. They came by wagon train from the gold camps of Nevada and California, and they came by pack trains from the Pikes Peak camps. Without lawmen to protect them, these men knew Virginia City and Bannock were ripe for plunder. This is really an extremely cosmopolitan community in the true sense of the word, the Toynbean sense of the word. Uh, I mean, you have a Chinese communities, you have Native American communities, you have large numbers of Irish, Irish Catholics. You have, uh, they often called these people Missourians, as if they were all from Missouri. Well, they tended to come from all over the South, but they came through the gateway state of Missouri. Uh, these groups tended naturally to cluster together. For example, one element that naturally clustered were the Masons, uh, who, with their secret oaths and so on, would become, I think, a major part of the vigilante movement. Uh, as long as the temperature was kept down, they could get along pretty well with each other. But uh, when you start communities as wild and, uh, and rapidly formed as Bannock City and Virginia City, it's like you're turning up the, the, the heat very high on a water kettle. And uh, they did boil over. Elected as Bannock's first sheriff in 1863, 
With the help of his shady friends, Henry Plummer, himself wanted for murder in California, is reputed to have organized his own gang of road agents to rob and murder the citizens of the very town he had been hired to protect. Calling themselves the Innocents, Henry Plummer's road agents took control of local businesses and the local gold camp routes. When no one stood up to them, the gang got bolder and more violent. I'm not sure we're ever going to know the final truth about Henry Plummer. Uh, you know, we know that he came from the California camps through Idaho. Uh, he apparently was a very ingratiating personality. He got himself elected sheriff, appointed marshal. Uh, he, he, it seems to me that the traditional wisdom about Plummer is still the main, the main stem of the truth. That, uh, again, not without precedent, that the, that the sheriff actually uh, has, has an outlaw organization affiliated with him. Uh, that can't last very long, and it didn't last very long. The vigilante movement that destroyed this gang, uh, and there's a good question of just how cohesive or large a gang that was, is, is really one of the spectacular vigilante movements in American history. By the fall of 1863, the road agents were killing with impunity. By some accounts, they murdered over 100 people in as many days and robbed over a quarter million dollars in gold. Outraged by the open murders of several men, among them Plummer's only honest deputy, the people of Virginia City decided to take matters into their own hands. The Montana spirit has always been one of fierce independence. We have always prided ourselves on our ability to be self-sufficient. But the human community needs a common law that protects our freedoms. The men and women of Virginia City who rejected the claim of every man for himself realized this fact and acted in good faith upon it. Bannock in Virginia and Nevada cities were beyond the influence of organized law. There was no established court system, no jails, no police or army outpost within hundreds of miles. Law was marginal. Justice was makeshift. As the outlaws took the upper hand, the fearful citizens resorted to makeshift courts. In an impromptu street court, witnesses accused Henry Plummer's men, Stinson, Lyons, and Forbes, of killing his only honest deputy, J.W. Dillingham. I think the lawless situation that, that mushroomed in early Montana is not so much the fact there wasn't a state government, it's the fact there was not even a really working territorial government. These camps were so isolated, and even the first beginnings of federal authority were so weak uh, that even regular courts weren't being held. Uh, the appointment of marshals was haphazard in these early years. The fact is there isn't even really an effective territorial government in these first months. And so you have a, a, a real situation here. We like to talk in America about the great self-governing ability of frontiersmen, and there's, there's a lot to that. But here you have extremely isolated but really fairly large communities uh, like Virginia City that have almost no effective uh, federal government or even territorial government and therefore uh, chaos reigned for a while not for very long but for long enough to make quite a mess the court consisted of three judges all of whom were medical doctors pressed into service the prosecutor was a blacksmith the trial of Plummer's deputies took place in the back of a springboard wagon in the middle of a muddy Virginia City street the jury was little more than a street mob the blacksmith put forth his case, and the deputy's lawyer rebutted. Evidence consisted of hearsay and accusation. The miners' court found Stinson and Lyons guilty and sentenced them to hang. Forbes was acquitted. As Stinson and Lyons were being led to their execution, a great emotional plea for mercy swelled up in the crowd. Friends of Stinson and Lyons, among them ladies of questionable reputation, managed to stir up a frenzy of emotion for the condemned men. Among all this confusion, the mob recanted the death sentence and banished the men instead. Stinson and Lyons quickly left the valley, but would be back within the year. In this court, guilt or innocence wasn't as important as the strength of partnerships that had been forged on the creek. The friends of a man who had been accused of jumping a claim or stirring up trouble in the camp would make a bold and impassioned plea on his behalf. These emotional outbursts had little to do with evidence. Consequently, a person's guilt or innocence was decided by popular vote, often swayed by clever oration or outright intimidation. The miner's court is, is often vaunted as a great uh, example of our uh, Americans' uh, natural instincts for democracy. That's true as far as it goes. Miner's courts, however, were 
uh, makeshift government some, in some ways at its worst. I mean, they'd be, they were purely democratic. They'd be called uh, at the spur of the moment. You never knew quite who you'd get. Sometimes the juries were even the, the, all the participants. Uh, they might be held in a bar uh, on a, su a Sunday uh, with the bar cloaked over, uh, or closed down at least. The problem was they were extremely unstable. They could easily be swayed by, uh, by emotion showed at the site. Uh, participants might not be very well informed. Uh, nobody wanted to see somebody hanged if the person's wife or, or girlfriend showed up. Uh, the, the juries lived in fear of that because they'd say, well, let's banish him instead of killing him. And often when they banished him, these people were right back again. So they, they, they could not provide any stable form of, of justice or law and order. With the court's failure to pass down a meaningful sentence, the innocents felt they had a free hand to do whatever they wanted. Plummer's purported reign of terror continued, but came to a head in December of 1863, when a friend of Plummer's named George Ives killed a man over two mules and his poke of gold. The miners arrested Ives. And when Henry Plummer hired every available lawyer to defend Ives, the miners asked a newcomer, Colonel Wilbur Fiss Sanders, to prosecute the case for them. Sanders led a spirited, aggressive prosecution. He charged a jury not to waver with his famous exhortation, men, do your duty. For the first time since the innocents took control of Bannock in Virginia City, the people stood up and convicted Ives and sentenced him to hang. The trial of George Ives in December of 1863 was important. Ives was on trial for murder, but law and order were on trial too. Should Ives go free, it would be an open admission that established government and justice meant absolutely nothing. Every man was armed, and most of them were not entirely in sympathy with the cause of law and order. Men, do your duty. Those are the words cast in bronze on the base of a statue of Wilbur Fisk Sanders near the state capitol. Sanders uttered those words 130 years ago in the same city in which the jury deliberated the fate of George Ives. Law and order and decency were first recognized in Montana by that first jury. They didn't render a judgment based on prejudice, passion, or sympathy. Instead, they rendered their judgment based upon their duty to do what was right. But when Sanders demanded an immediate execution, the court balked. Instead, it wanted to give Ives time to put his affairs in order before hanging him. But when a man named X. Beadler climbed up on the roof of a cabin above the crowd and shouted passionately to Ives, how much time did you give the Dutchman before you killed him? The crowd forgot its compassion, and Ives was hung immediately. Well, eventually, uh, uh, the... Uh uh, trial come to a conclusion and they found that George Ives was guilty of the murder of Tabalt. And they, uh, at this point, the many attorneys made a motion to uh, let George Ives have a little time to write his letter, his mother a letter and settle his business affairs before he was hanged. It was a very emotional plea. And uh, Dr. Byam and the others didn't know quite how to handle this plea because it was so emotional and and there was such a large crowd, they were a little afraid of a riot in the crowd if uh, they didn't uh, grant it, because uh, even the good people would probably agree that he should be given this time. Uh, the real reason for it, they knew, was that the plumber was probably coming from Bannock, uh, coming to make a farce of the trial, as he had done with the Dillingham trial in Virginia City, and if they allowed this time, which settling the business affairs might take up to several days, uh, there would probably be a rescue of George Ives. The trial would probably become a farce. And another, uh, the road agents could go on with their uh, murders as they had done. The execution of Ives was a turning point in the triumph of justice and order over chaos and lawlessness. The message was clear. The people could be pushed only so far, and then they were going to push back. Individually, no one dared stand up to the road agents. But collectively, they had a chance. There is no deprivation of human dignity when a criminal is rightfully convicted. It is a demonstration that we haven't lost confidence in our opinion of right and wrong, of good and evil, of righteous and wicked, of deserving and undeserving, of human and inhuman. And it is a demonstration that we are not so morally ambivalent that we cannot assess responsibility for another's actions. The sentiment that frontier justice was better than no justice at all took root in the popular consciousness. 
Within days of Ives hanging, a self-appointed vigilance committee was created, a secret organization. Its members acted as judge, jury, and executioners, often trying the accused in absentia on the basis of accusation and gossip. Sentences were carried out with ruthless efficiency. Over the next two months, the vigilantes hanged 23 alleged road agents and publicly whipped others. Even more were banished by the committee's decree. The vigilante movement in, in Bannock, Virginia City, uh, we don't know a great deal about it. This is typical of vigilante movements, like even the regulators in colonial times. You, you don't know very much about them. The even more destructive ones in central Montana in the 1880s, we know even less about. We know that a, that a group of these people got together out of the frustration of murders, like the Magruder Party murder from Lewiston, uh, probably the most bestial of all the killings of this group, whoever they were. Uh, it would appear that what happened was that, again, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the Civil War mining rush as having a southern element and a northern element, this was the northern element. They viewed these people as uh, ruffians, as murderers. Uh, you could, they weren't quite sure who the innocents were, or the plumber gang, or whatever you want to call them. Uh, and so they tended to stereotype them. You know, if there were Mexicans, uh, if there were Southerners, uh, this was the riffraff that had to be cleaned out. The vigilantes were anything but a ragtag group of men hell-bent on cleaning up Virginia City. They were highly disciplined and tightly organized with bylaws and oaths swearing secrecy. A 17-member executive committee oversaw an echelon of captains, each of whom was responsible for a cell of 50 men. It's estimated that somewhere between 1,000 and 2,500 people took the secret oath of the vigilantes. Their organization was strikingly similar to that of the Masons, and many historians believe that the organizers of the vigilantes were in fact Masons. I think when you look at how the vigilantes operated, uh, there's a lot we don't know about it. We know they obviously got together and signed an oath. We know that a, a person like Sanders served as a sort of prosecutor. Uh, we know that James Williams, we don't know much about James Williams, except that he obviously was a, was a tough individual who uh, didn't blanch at taking life. We know that it, 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 anybody familiar with rural America or who grew, who grew up in rural America is familiar with the sort of joining mentality that goes on in rural communities where uh, a, rural, a rural fire department would be a very good example. You ring the bell, people come, and they quickly organize into, in this case, fairly sizable squads of men who rode out and apprehended and hanged the people that they were after. And then they went back to what they were doing before. Uh, it looks a little bit like guerrilla activity that we've seen since World War II in places like the Philippines or Vietnam, where uh, you know one minute somebody's out in the field, and the next minute uh, he's in a makeshift army, so to speak. The next minute he's back out in the field again. It's not surprising that historians coming along 100 years later have a hard time figuring out what they actually did. The vigilantes often left their calling card pinned to a dangling corpse a skull and crossbones with the numbers 3, 7, 77. There are different theories what the numbers mean. Well, the insignia 3, 7, 77, just like vigilantes themselves, have become part of Montana lore. In fact, you can uh, read the work that Rex Myers has done on this, trying to figure out what these mean. Uh, 3, 7, 77 may have been uh, the, uh, the numerical uh, code names of three vigilantes by number. It may have been the dimensions of a, of a grave, a three feet by seven feet by 77 inches. Uh, who knows? It simply, we do know, was the identification used by vigilantes. Uh, I never find it too reassuring that one sees that on the insignia of the highway patrol, uh, given the way some of the vigilantes disposed of the people they were dealing with. We don't really know exactly what it means. The finger of guilt eventually pointed at Henry Plummer and his men. The vigilantes acted quickly and condemned Henry Plummer to hang. But when they rode to Bannock to arrest him, they found he'd been tipped off. Strangely enough, Plummer came back to Bannock six days later. The vigilantes hung him from the same gallows Plummer had built to hang his own victims. According to local accounts, Plummer was carrying a list of all the members of his alleged gang, a highly unlikely total of 139 men. But as the list circulated among the vigilantes, the list kept growing. Committee members apparently were adding names. Revisionists can come along and, uh, like J.W. Smur did in Montana back in the late 50s, and start pointing out, hey, the vigilantes, there's a downside, there's a dark side to this vigilante activity. Uh, at that time, 40 years ago, that, 
well, those were fighting words. Now, people don't really want to fight a whole lot about that kind of revisionism now. Smur was, was really quite correct in pointing out that a lot of abuses took place under the secrecy of vigilanteism. It always does. On December of 1864, United States Chief Justice Hosmer supported the clandestine acts of the vigilantes and justified their actions under the principle of self-defense. But the Chief Justice also admonished the citizens of Virginia City to strive to create stateside law and order. The short but bloody reign of the road agent and the vigilante was over. Henry Plummer is such a nebulous figure, and his death was so immediate, uh, along with his associates, and the vigilante's activities were so clouded or cloaked in secrecy that we don't know a great deal. You know, we know what early writers like Dimsdale uh, and Langford wrote about them, but uh, these people were writing in part to justify what the vigilantes did. So the truth is hard to find, and you can revise it in various directions. The vigilantes, obviously not all of them, were, uh, were doing things that, uh, modern, or that, that any modern uh, observer would think were appropriate. Uh, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that, in my opinion, that Plummer was somehow a, a victim. Uh, I don't see him that way. By the summer of 1864, prospectors made other gold strikes in Immigrant, Confederate, and Last Chance Gulch. The golden glory days of Virginia City were over. Within a few years, Virginia City's population would drop to less than 2,000, and in 1875, the city lost its status as a territorial capital. The wild, boundless enthusiasm of the miners hoping to strike the mother load tempered into a sense of solid respectability. As the free gold in the streams played out, companies organized to begin dredging and hard rock mining. The gold found at Virginia City was some of the purest anywhere, and so for some, its lure remained irresistible. But the constraints of civilization were now in place, and the day of the road agent and his nemesis, the vigilante, were already fading into the past. Even as we brought civilized law to the Montana Territory, the independent spirit survived, even until today. There are still those in Montana who would take the law into their own hands, people who reject the common tenets of law. These people, rightly or wrongly, have always been a part of Montana's political landscape. Well, I think the vigilante does make a very good hero. Uh, and this goes really back, I think, to the colonial times, that the, the isolated, the, the, the Cincinnatus-type, Roman-type hero, the, the citizen who will step forward uh, when oppressed by a heavy-handed government or by, by wrongdoing in the absence of government. This is one of America's favorite heroes. And it, the, the vigilante hero is yet one more rendering of the romantic uh, individualist the John Wayne hero, and it makes a pretty it makes a pretty compelling hero. It's just another variant of what the frontier lawman, uh, the Gary Cooper in High Noon, the tough individual who stands alone when everyone else runs. The vigilante is one variant of that. It's interesting to me that Hollywood has not, to my awareness, ever tried to pick up on Plummer, probably because he died so ingloriously, pleading for his life. Today, Virginia City remains the last preserved gold rush town of its kind. History has paved over much of the past, but thanks to the work of people like Charles Bovey, who believe the past is worth remembering, we can still step into the past and feel what it must have been like to hear the cry of a miner finding a big nugget. Or we can tremble to hear the hooves of the road agent's horses chasing down the stage, or the murmur of the crowd in the street during the trial of George Ives. There are still important lessons to learn here. Lessons that can be found in the old stores and stables. Lessons in the narrow streets. Lessons in the last remnants of this chapter of American history.